네, 여러분 반갑습니다. 경기도가 주최하고 킨텍스가 주관하는 제1회 2020 경기국제수소포럼 사회를 맡은 경기도청 아나운서 구영슬입니다. Hello, my name is Kuyan Sil. I'll be your MC for this uh, next session on 2020 Gyeonggi International Hydrogen Forum. We will be moving on to the ne next session. For this, I would like to inform you that we do provide Korean and English simultaneous interpretation, so please uh, check the relevant channels on your YouTube feed. Session. Korean and English simultaneous interpretation is available for today's conference. So please check the YouTube channel for your convenience. The 이번 session의 주제. This session is held under the theme of uh, the establishment of a hydrogen industry ecosystem based on technologies. First of all, we would like to hear from two different leading uh, global companies. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we were not able to invite international guests here to Korea. So we would like to meet them online through a virtual conferencing platform. First, we'd like to hear from Peter <coughs> Mackey. He's the Vice President of HE2 Strategy and Policy Supports at Air Liquid. Session 3. Mr. Peter Mackey, please begin your presentation. Hello, and uh, first I'd like to say that it's an honor to be invited to address this conference. Uh, Korea is obviously one of the leading countries in encouraging and developing a hydrogen, hydrogen economy. And Air Liquide was proud earlier this year to announce our involvement in the mobility project at Incheon Airport here in uh, Gyeonggi province. Air Liquide is one of the world's leading industrial gas companies. We supply atmospheric and other gases to a wide array of customers from hospitals and metal workers to steel and chemical manufacturers. In 2018, we published our aggressive climate objectives to reduce our own carbon intensity by 30% by 2025, to support our customers in their decarbonization and to support new low carbon ecosystems. We're already one of the world's largest suppliers of merchant hydrogen. We're involved in all aspects of the supply chain. Not only do we reform hydrogen from natural gas, but we also operate around 40 small electrolyzers today. And we supply our customers by both truck and nearly 2,000 kilometers of hydrogen pipelines. The majority of this hydrogen is used today to desulfurize fuel, but we also supply the space industry, steel, glass, and of course, transport. Elikid's been one of the leading advocates of the use of hydrogen as a clean transport fuel. Our development work began well over 20 years ago. Just in the last five years, we've invested over half a billion euros in new hydrogen applications. We've installed more than 120 refueling stations. In the US, we're currently building the largest hydrogen liquefier for the mobility market. And we're building the world's largest PEM electrolyzer in Canada at the moment. But of course, we've long recognized the proverbial chicken and egg challenge that hydrogen mobility faces. On the one hand, the lack of refueling infrastructure because of the lack of vehicles. And on the other, the lack of vehicles due to the lack of infrastructure. It's clear that an integrated and coordinated ecosystem of producers, distributors, refueling, and vehicle fleets is essential. This is the only way to ensure that all stages of the supply chain are synchronized and develop as quickly and cost-effectively as possible. <clears throat> One of our major contributions to this objective was the foundation of the Hydrogen Council at Davos back in 2017, which we've been proud to co-chair with Hyundai over the past couple of years. It was established with two key objectives. First, to support and advocate for the use of hydrogen to address, address climate change. And second, to bring together the CEOs of companies throughout the supply chain to support and synchronize investment and business activities. Initially, the council consisted of, consisted of just 13 companies, but it has since grown at the latest count to 92. Most importantly, as a CEO-led industry organization, it ensures commitment and coordination at the most senior level. And this is important in discussions with governments and policymakers around the world 
as it illustrates the commitment of industry to finding effective solutions in partnership with society and public bodies. I should emphasize that governments and policymakers are, of course, a vital part of the ecosystem. Through mandate, policy support, and public finance, they, or in some cases you, create and mold the market framework into which the industry will develop. As you know, here in Europe, where I'm based, we've seen a rush of supportive strategies aimed at recovering from the COVID pandemic in a much more climate sensitive way. Close to 50 billion euros of explicit support has been earmarked by a number of countries and the EU, with a carbon contract, contract for different schemes still to be defined on top of that. And the policy environment is similarly supportive uh, with you in, uh, in Asia. Taylor Keed is one of the co-chairs of the Hydrogen Council today, and it's actively working to coordinate the ecosystem with a focus on three pillars, which are key to the successful, successful positioning of hydrogen. And I'll just borrow uh, three slides from the Hydrogen Council. The first pillar is often taken for granted, but it is absolutely pivotal, and that's safety. It's been said many times that it would be impossible today to introduce today's gasoline fueling infrastructure, untrained personnel pumping highly flammable liquid into a vehicle with few safety measures and little oversight or control is unthinkable. Hydrogen presents additional challenges involving high pressures and very low temperatures. And let's be honest, the echoes of the Hindenburg disaster over 80 years ago still resonate today. So for hydrogen to develop as a fuel of the future, able to be used by members of the public, not just highly trained industrial personnel, safety is critical to our collective license to operate. At Air Liquide, we've handled hydrogen for decades and we fully recognize the unique challenges that it presents. Standards and regulations must be established to ensure that newcomers into the industry operate safely and don't jeopardize the development of the market. The industry must work hard to promote the risk awareness, the skills and expertise, and the processes to minimize and mitigate risks. Only this will protect the many new users and the environments in which we all live. Cost is the second and the most obvious pillar. The energy transition will be disruptive right the way through the economy. Not only will it impact industrial supply chains, but it will in, it demands significant changes of behavior by the end consumer as well. Bringing costs down towards that of current solutions will help to reduce the financial burden of that transition. Of course, scale will help enormously. In a study for the Hydrogen Council earlier this year, McKinsey estimated that scaling up electrolysis manufacturing could bring capex costs down by 60% and 40% for other related components. Better loading of a larger distribution infrastructure based on high pressure or ideally liquid hydrogen could bring distribution costs down by 70%. That will all contribute to making hydrogen a competitive alternative to current fossil fuels, particularly for commercial fleets over the next decade but it'll require coordination of the ecosystem to achieve and to optimize. Finally, clean pathways are also essential. There's little point in redesigning the global supply chain if it doesn't in the end integrate clean, low carbon solutions. But numerous pathways are likely to develop in parallel, requ requiring coordination throughout the supply chain. Biomethane relies on integration into agricultural and municipal waste chains. Electrolysis has to be coordinated with available renewable or low carbon power. CCUS relies on the development of another infrastructure and supply chain back to appropriate carbon sinks. And industrial processed byproducts can be leveraged to provide alternative sources of energy to other markets. So I'd now like to turn to a few practical examples where El Aquid has coordinated the ecosystem to develop and expand specific product projects. First, in our home country, France, we created the Hype Company to enter the captive fleet market and develop a fleet of hydrogen powered taxis. Hype was founded in 2015 as a joint venture 
uh, with a local entrepreneur with five drivers and one refueling station. We won the support of the Mayor of Paris to open a refueling station near our headquarters in the city centre to showcase the technology for the COP21 meeting with the support of Hyundai series of vehicles. Toyota then also joined as a partner and vehicle supplier along with a number of financial investors. Currently, the company operates a fleet of 130 vehicles. The next step will see the expansion of the business to over 600 cars, bigger fueling stations and integration into electrolysis. Our intention is to develop a replicable package of assets, taxi licenses and cars that can be adapted and offered elsewhere in the world. Next, I'll mention the Hydrogen Mobility Consortium in Germany, H2M. This seeks to overcome the chicken and egg question by bringing together a number of partners in the supply chain, oil and gas and industrial gas companies, along with auto OEMs, to develop a retail refueling infrastructure. Air Liquide founded the H2M consortium with five other companies in 2015. It's since won the support of another five car manufacturers, including Hyundai, and accessed funding from the German Ministry of Transport and the European Commission. Financial investors have also joined the effort to accelerate the infrastructure rollout. H2M's already installed over 80 hydrogen stations throughout Germany, and it's aiming for up to 400 by 2025. Beyond that, H2 Mobility is itself a partner in the Hydrogen Mobility Europe scheme under the control of the European Union to create a Europe-wide station network. We further adapted this ecosystem approach when we announced earlier this year, along with the Port of Rotterdam, the Hytruck Consortium. There is strong political and social support for decarbonisation in the Netherlands. And it's clear that decarbonisation of the port itself, the industry around it, and the related heavy duty transport has to be a priority. So Air Liquide, the port, and a truck OEM created Hytruck to mobilize logistics companies, hydrogen suppliers, and retail industry customers, people like Carrefour, to develop such a solution. The aim is to deploy a fleet of a thousand trucks by 2025 across the Netherlands, Belgium, and Western Germany, along with the necessary refueling infrastructure and the hydrogen supply to satisfy them. Finally, I mentioned earlier the Incheon project. As you probably know, Air Liquide joined forces with Hyundai and Hynet, the hydrogen station network in Korea, to set up a bus project at the airport. The project includes the two largest capacity refueling stations to date in Korea. Hyundai will supply the buses. We will supply the hydrogen and the filling stations. While Hynet will operate the stations and they also plan to open them up to the retail market to further support the rollout of passenger vehicles in the country. So those are some practical examples of Air Liquide's efforts to develop ecosystems around the world. What lessons have we learned? First, leaders must bring a vision and a drive to the project with a willingness to adapt traditional business models and develop entirely new ones. Partners must act as true partners, sharing experience, risk, and commitment. And we have to listen to a much more diverse range of voices, not just our traditional customers, but new and agile entrepreneurs and startups, policymakers, politicians, NGOs, and of course, society in general. As we look into the future, we'll see such ecosystems becoming bigger and more complex. A large scale supply chain will increasingly integrate liquid hydrogen which itself brings added complexity. A hydrogen energy system will likely evolve uh, in involving imported as well as locally produced liquid product. And that will require further coordination through the supply chain. Air Liquide will use its strengths and experience in production and handling of, of liquid hydrogen to help initiate these new complex ecosystems in Korea and elsewhere. Our experience in liquid hydrogen originates from our work with the space industry and with high-tech uh, industries with CERN in Switzerland 
and the ITER uh, nuclear fusion research project. Now, while these might seem highly specialized in the context of the energy transition, they have actually con contributed valuable developments to our liquid hydrogen offer today. So in conclusion, ecosystems are critical in developing effective hydrogen solutions and in using public and private money to deliver society's needs efficiently, rapidly and profitably. We've plenty of examples of local uh, ecosystems establishing local supply chains. Similar structures will need to develop to coordinate new hydrogen-based international energy vectors, aligning energy production with distribution and end demand. And the Hydrogen Council will continue to provide a forum for ecosystem development at the global level. Ehrlichy looks forward to remaining a key partner in many of these efforts in the future. Thank you. Mr. Peter McKay. Peter McKay, 부사장님. Thank you very much, Mr. Peter McKay. Next, we'd like to hear from Cheryl Chan, uh, head of the APEC Clean Hydrogen Division at Linde. Very good morning and good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Chan from Linda. Today I'll be sharing with you about Linda's clean hydrogen. Before I begin my presentation, let me just share with you a short video clip. The hydrogen future is here now and Linda can deliver it. The company covers every link in the hydrogen value chain from source to service. Low carbon hydrogen can support efforts to limit global warming it has the ability to decarbonize large sectors of the global economy. Linda has the technologies and expertise to unlock the massive potential of hydrogen. The most promising use cases include hydrogen as a low or zero carbon source of fuel for cars and heavy transport, as feedstock gas for chemical chains and refining, and as fuel for direct combustion in steelmaking and similar industries. Linda supports its hydrogen customers every step of the way, from production and processing, through distribution and storage, to the final point of use. The hydrogen journey starts out with production. At the conventional end of the spectrum, we have gray hydrogen. This is generated by the steam reforming or partial oxidation of natural gas or heavy hydrocarbons. In the next step on the decarbonization journey, we see blue hydrogen. Here, the carbon emitted by steam reforming is captured, stored underground, or reused. The ultimate goal is, of course, green hydrogen. This is made by splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, also known as electrolysis, using renewable energy. Today, Linda already covers all production schemes and models. Once the hydrogen has been generated, it needs to be purified. It can then be compressed, liquefied, or fed to a downstream synthesis process. Here also, Linda has the assets, technologies, and capabilities to support every step in the processing flow. Linda's expertise also covers the full storage and distribution spectrum of hydrogen. It could be transported as liquid hydrogen around the world in ships and tankers. The company also supplies the gas by pipeline to chemical and other industrial hubs. In addition, it stores it in underground caverns. Last but not least, Linda delivers bulk liquid supplies to customers with on-site cryogenic storage tanks. Moving along to the actual point of use, Linda is also innovating many hydrogen delivery technologies. These include pump technologies for hydrogen fueling stations and tailored application technologies for the delivery of hydrogen in industries such as metal, glass, refining, and steel. And the list of new and promising business cases is constantly expanding. Think hydrogen. Think Linda. Okay, so today we're going to talk about Linda's uh, clean hydrogen. And as a start to this, I would like to share with you what we think the status of hydrogen development is, especially around clean hydrogen in the world. So first, I think it's at a point when we think there's a lot of favorable trends that's encouraging this clean hydrogen globally. But of course, there are certain uncertainties that remain. Let's begin with what 
are the trends that's actually supporting this clean hydrogen that's moving forward? First, I think there's actually very strong commitment and a huge push to limit the carbon emissions globally. Many countries have actually signed up and also made commitments to become net zero or what we consider carbon neutral by the time it comes in 2050. And this target becomes very useful because one of the things that it pushes is for the countries and the regions to really start putting together a national roadmap of what it takes to move towards clean hydrogen. Many of them have also put on a lot of funds and grants in order to be channeled to supporting the execution of these clean hydrogen roadmaps. And as this industry starts growing in terms of momentum, one of the very key things that we've seen is the take up rates of people that's participating in the Hydrogen Council globally. You know, over the last three years, this numbers has grown from about 13 members to now 92. And this showed that sort of interest levels. So on a very regular basis, many of us will have heard about projects that's being announced, whether it's the public and private sector partnerships. And all this is really important for the industry to move ahead. And as it goes, over time, we will see this transition between the brown and grey hydrogen into some extent of a blue hydrogen and eventually to green. And this entire energy transition is key for the industry. There will come a point when we will be able to reduce the entire cost of ownership in terms of the green hydrogen. And it will begin to fall, partly because of the scale of adoption, in particular around renewables, as well as the fact that a lot of technology is being adopted to help in the deindustrialization. But some aspects of it would still have certain uncertainties around it. So take, for example, from a global trend itself, what extent of carbon taxes or what we consider carbon price will actually be sufficient in order for there to be a tip to, or sort of a push to move towards a complete blue and green hydrogen. There needs to be an economics around it to make this entire business viable. And I think this will need to come in terms of working hand in hand between the government as well as the private sector. So the industry players will need to have a lot of policy support and probably some new areas of regulations that will allow areas that's not having a strong roadmap in place to move towards this direction. So take, for example, you know, the, the key powerhouses, for example, the US as well as China. And then what will it need for them to transform towards a clean hydrogen? Of course, there's a huge value chain in the entire hydrogen space, but there would be certain amount of um, move, you know, beyond the initial hypes that we've seen apart from all these announcements, apart from MOUs and also a letter intent between companies and also with the government. What will it take to really execute clean hydrogen on the ground? And therefore, this adoption of green hydrogen as an alternative becomes one of the key thought process as we look towards it. Would it be sufficient to, to reduce the entire ecosystem towards you know, having enough renewable power that's being put on the ground? I think this is where it brings me to the next point, which is what lies in the natural geography itself. So as you can see, this transition of energy towards grey to green hydrogen will take a lot of things. One, from the government framework and the other one, what really exists within the, the countries itself. Some of the natural resources exist today and in certain countries, so take for example in Australia and some parts of Europe, there would naturally be an abundance of renewable powers. And eventually these countries can also become exporters of green hydrogen to a certain extent. And therefore, there we will see, you know, for example, places where there's a lot of solar PV and wind power, there would be a natural geography for green hydrogen from a very start, if there's enough government momentum as well as government support in the entire national roadmap. Then there are others where today they are already considered quite low in carbon footprint. And for those, I think naturally they would continue to have some amount of natural gas in, in their pipelines and they will move towards what we consider the blue hydrogen where there's actually more emphasis in terms of carbon capture and also the utilization and storage of hydrogen. And of course there will be others, for example like US itself, there will be a combination of both the 
blue as well as the green hydrogen. And therefore, the government's support and measures become very key in this entire aspect. So the US, the EU, they've put in not only certain targets of where they want to move to, some in the early stage, for example, in transportation mobility, but there's also others where it's more comprehensive throughout the entire footprint. So they would go across the entire value chain, different industries, different sectors would also have a potential of being part of this investments. And so, you know, Germany has always been taking a very lead front in this area. So in terms of hydrogen deployment, they will be far more advanced than many other geographies. But we're beginning to see this shift as well in Asia Pacific. You have China, Australia, as well as Korea, putting behind a huge amount of efforts not only defining what it takes in the national roadmap, but really which other players within the industry will make a key differentiator in order to put the country forward in this entire hydrogen deployment. So we look forward to a lot more of all these partnerships and efforts between the government as well as the private sector. And if you can see, what are the different segments of the end hydrogen applications that's very key in this place? We see today, first of all, it's in the very traditional industries where they are very huge in terms of carbon footprint. So take, for example, the industrial feedstocks. You have the refineries, the, the petrochemical players, as well as the steel mines. But over time, this will only be a small amount of what we consider the decarbonization that may really take place because one of the things is hydrogen becomes a very viable alternative for them and some of it because of their traditional footprint and the technology that's in place, the amount of decarbonization can only move towards a certain aspect. And therefore, the countries that wants to go huge in terms of decarbonization would have to find other sectors which will become a large, much larger player. Take, for example, one, and in particular in Korea, there's actually a very huge push towards decarbonization using hydrogen as one of the alternative fuels in mobility. And there will be a, a huge variety of what it is. It can come from the public transportation. It could also be the heavy um, commercial vehicles like the trucks as well as the buses and also the, the commercial cars like the passenger vehicles. We would see this as the entire array of different transportation modes that would eventually move towards it because of the government regulatory pressures. And the fact that to some extent, electric uh, vehicles would have a certain limit in terms of the advances if there isn't a clear breakthrough in terms of the battery technology and in terms of storage as well as the e-waste management. So we think this might be a early stage for moving into blue and green hydrogen, but it doesn't rule out the, the possibility once there's actually, you know, Chances of, for example, in Korea, they can actually bring in and import huge amount of green hydrogen to, in, in order to support that particular segment. But at the same time, there would be at other usage, for example, the building and the industrial heating. And how this is going to happen is we look towards first the blending inside the gas networks. So in many of the city areas, there's actually an extensive network of gas pipelines that exist today. And all this, um, including the ability to do power generation, would be key in terms of how this decarbonization can take place. Some percentage of uh, hydrogen that's being blended in the gas pipelines today, they are already in, in Europe, they start from about 5 to 10 percent, but there could also be potential of going higher if there is a possibility of changing some parts of this grid networks and also the boilers that's in place to produce the amount of heating. So by repurposing all these natural gas grids, there is a larger potential for the country actually to move into huge amount of decarbonization. And also in the rural areas where there isn't a dense network, they could also use it for power generation. So we think, you know, this kind of backup supply would be very important for a country as they move towards looking at all the other different opportunity usage for hydrogen. And next, I'll just talk about how Linda can really play in this partnership. As you know, Linda is a key player in the entire hydrogen supply chain, whether it's in the traditional hydrogen or as we move towards the clean hydrogen space. And which color of hydrogen, actually, we're rather agnostic to this aspect because we participate in every part of that value chain. 
we have partnerships in different aspects of the hydrogen inputs. So take, for example, with natural gas players, the existing ones that have the grid pipelines, as well as we're partnering with a lot more renewable players, whether they are in the wind power or they are in hydropower as well as in the solar PV. So with these partnerships, it just means one thing of moving towards the green technology because we have our, our own technology in electrolysis. We've got investments in ITM power, which actually have what we call the proton exchange membrane electrolyzer technology. And that we believed would be the next front runner in terms of being able to decarbonize by really going fully green. But at the same time, we do have customers who is actually today producing in whether it's the refinery, the petrochemical complexes, they use the, the traditional technology of the SMRs and ATRs to produce it. But there also lies the opportunity to do carbon capture or CCUS for that matter. And being the leader in this, of course, it brings about that we helped in distribution of the hydrogen that's being produced. And some parts of it, uh, we've got probably the first, the global world um, commercially viable hydrogen storage cave that exists in the US Gulf Coast. So all the way from Lake Charles until Freeport itself, we've got an extensive network of pipelines in which all the different oil refineries would be tapped onto the pipeline. And so they could produce this for storage for a good, you know, even up to 10 days of production production storage worth within the hydrogen cavern. And that hydrogen cavern has been in production for a good tank decade. And of course, we have our next technology, which is around the part of liquefaction. So by producing liquid hydrogen, it is one alternative as well in terms of transportation, because it's better um, at the lower pressures at which it's, it's used for transportation on the roads. But also the fact that as we move towards the city centre, this sort of storage may require smaller footprint, less land area, and also it makes it more viable in terms of having a buffer stock for a longer period of time. So these are the different aspects that we've used to, to do our distribution of our hydrogen today. But at the same time, we bring it to the end application. So take for example, Linda has got uh, more than in excess of 190 hydrogen refilling stations globally today. And we operate that through remote operation centers as well. So in a very safe way, I think one of the key aspects of operating any parts of the hydrogen value chain is to be safe. And this is one value that we can really bring to the partners and, and to our customers. And so as I've explained earlier, all the different hydrogen applications that we can take part in, we're building partnerships in different geographies in the world, and we hope to do that as well in, in Korea. And if I can just um, end off with some of the different projects that we're beginning to see that's coming upstream. One of it, of course, I have to point out um, that, you know, in Korea, we've definitely had this hydrogen refilling stations that we've put up with the Korean Expressway Corporation. So we're looking towards in, in installing them by next year. And also hopefully we can distribute more over the years um, within Korea because there's such a big push towards hydrogen as you know, a few were within the mobility space. But at the same time, I think there's also other projects we're working on. For example, the partnership that we're going to work with Hyosung to put up the first liquefier project um, within Korea. And we certainly can look at other projects that we can work towards, not just in Korea itself, but also throughout the world. As you can see, even the ammonia plants, we've got the parts in South Pacific and Australia. We're going fully green, which is putting out a 15 megawatt electrolyzer project. And also the iron and steel industries, trying to help them decarbonize. We can also, because of the small footprint of the PEM electrolyzers, they can be done site by site in existing sites of the refineries. And at the same time, um, we could also look into putting the energy into the energy grid and the utility space by creating side by side network where they're producing. So one, they could tap the renewable power, but at the same time, 
through electrolysis technology, we could produce the green hydrogen and pump it within the pipelines itself that goes into the utility grid. They could start small at 5 to 10% uh, blending, but over time we see the opportunity to go much larger scale. So for example, the projects that we have with Siemens and also in Europe itself. And I think this is what makes it exciting as an overall technology and also be a frontier to really bring clean fuel to the market space in the years to come. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Ms. Cheryl Tan, thank you for the Cheryl Tan Pumunjangnim. Thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Cheryl Tan. Next, I'd like to invite our next presenter who will deliver a presentation on the cases of collaboration in hydrogen technology development for localization. Min Ho Sung, Business Development Department Head of Colgate Tech, will deliver the presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sung Min Ho. I'd like to talk about the localization status of the hydrogen technology here in Korea and the Colgate's tax efforts to further develop the hydrogen industry and the collaboration case. And particularly, this collaboration case is engaged by a small and medium sized uh, company, and we have a future plan for further collaboration of um, its kind. First of all, I'd like to talk about why Colgas Tech has set the goal for localization of hydrogen technology. As you all know, uh, Korea uh, has come up with the roadmap for activation of hydrogen uh, economy. And by a 2022, uh, Korean government has a plan uh, to introduce uh, the FCEV uh, as many as uh, uh, 100,000. And also, it has an ambitious plan to localize 100% of key parts of this FCEV by a 2030. And now I'd like to talk about the current status of the localization of the hydrogen uh, technology. Currently, we have 53% of the localized uh, uh, technology. And when uh, the overseas or foreign compressor is applied, then we have 33% of the localized ratio of the key parts. Uh, but still, if we take a look at uh, the the refueling, uh, the facility-related parts, we have only 28% of the localized uh, parts. Now, uh, let me brief you on uh, the efforts of Colgate Tech in terms of localization of hydrogen um, industry technology. The biggest issue ahead of us is uh, the nozzle, uh, particularly in terms of freezing nozzle issue. So when it comes to the fueling of hydrogen fuel, or actually the fueling process is made at an extremely low temperature, uh, around minus 33 to minus 40 degrees Celsius. And actually freezing up this nozzle is a, a pain point for the users or drivers of the FCEV. And some people uh, said that they sprained their shoulders while you're trying to uh, uh, refueling uh, the hydrogen to their FCEV. And key issue here is how we can actually continuously fill a nitrogen to this nozzle uh, to prevent icing uh, in the nozzle area. The existing uh, nozzle for FCEV it do uh, have a certain uh, icing prevention uh, measures, uh, particularly those developed by Hyundai Motors. However, uh, such measures use air, and particularly uh, is, uh, uh, the, the device or the measure is about infu uh, I mean inputting or the, uh, uh, infusing some warm air to prevent the icing of the nozzle. However, it's too cost uh, 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 inefficient in terms of its price. So we have 78% of nitrogen in the air. So we can segregate uh, the nitrogen from the air thus producing uh, pure nitrogen. And if this nitrogen is uh, combined with this nozzle, then um, it will prevent the icing of the nozzle area. And it will cost 20 million Korean uh, one per year. And Ruri Corporation is installing this uh, hydrogen refueling station. And this new technology will be applied to the newly established refueling station of hydrogen. 
Actually, this new device for the prevention of nozzle IC requires uh, a lot of uh, investment uh, as well as operation cost, uh, particularly in terms of electricity bill. But it's uh, just a 30. A thousand Korean won per month, or one thousand and five hundred won per day. So this is a cost-effective and safe measure to prevent icing of the nozzle. And I believe that this kind of new uh, preventing measure for nozzle icing uh, will be used widely, and we will uh, do our utmost to publicize this new uh, icing prevent prevention nozzle for FCEV. The Colgate's attack is also uh, supporting the small and medium-sized uh, companies for the development of uh, hydrogen uh, technology. So we have a kind of purchase agreement with these small and medium-sized enterprises uh, that once they develop this hydrogen technology, the Colgate's attack will uh, purchase uh, those uh, technologies. Uh, one of uh, a case in, in that point is high pressure, uh, the hydrogen feeding uh, parts. Uh, one hundred percent of uh, hi high pressure hydrogen feeding um, is expo uh, imported from overseas countries, and, and this feeding uh, parts are very expensive parts. And uh, Koges attack uh, supports uh, the Korean uh, companies, particularly small and medium companies, to develop this high pressure uh, hydrogen feeding. Uh, MPI furrow uh, method is widely used for this high pressure hydrogen pairing. However, this method has high risk of missing tube and uh, another uh, the method utilized for this uh, the high pressure hydrogen pairing is cone and thread and which is hard to work out. And the other the method uh, or the connecting method is welding. It's relatively safe, however still um, it's hard to work out in the station. So we just come up with a new method of creating a small thread of the screw and actually it, uh, connect it uh, with uh, this uh, tube. And this new technology will be completed in terms of its development by the end of this year and around the next year it will be commercialized and be sold. And next, I'd like to talk about the operator uh, training simulator for hydrogen production facilities. We have uh, a few hydrogen refueling stations and the hydrogen production bases. And as for the training of the operator, uh, we have some difficulties in operating each and every device and the monitoring all the needed devices. But the malfunction or maloperation is a big issue in terms of uh, operation of hydrogen um, production facilities. So we actually developed this uh, training simulator creating the exactly same um, environment or the situation with the actual operation. And also, this uh, simulator um, enables uh, the train. Uh, I mean, the operators to make comparison between the normal situation and um, normal abnormal situation. So, if I provide a more detailed explanation on OTS, OTS is based on mathematical uh, model of operation uh, environment, providing and the comparison between normal situation and abnormal situation, and that model is used for the training of the simul uh, um, the operator of the system. And the production process model creates a virtual environment where there is a normal operation um, situation. So whenever there is the abnormal event occurs, then the operators will learn what kind of measures they can take to uh, correct the situation. By using this system, um, the training of uh, the operator will become easier than before, and the operators can uh, work on site after having sufficient training, and also it will improve uh, the safety of the operation field. So we have uh, been building about 18 refueling stations and two uh, production facilities right now at the moment. And our goal is to get up to about 
115 refueling stations, uh, 10 production sta facilities, and five hubs. For the production facilities, or all of these facilities, rather, the operation system, this OTS will be applied to all of them so that we can uh, guarantee a safe and accurate operation. The next, I'd like to talk about the different changes in the trends of uh, hydrogen. So right now, it's gasified hydrogen is going to be transported and then refueled, but this is going to be changed again going forward. One of them is uh, liquefied uh, hydrogen, and this is something that the government knows, and many people also believe that in going forward, liquefied hydrogen is going to be the key trend. However, if we look at the technological development behind liquefied hydrogen, there is really very little technology, almost no technology here in Korea. We don't have a process on liquefied hydrogen, It's but we, if we try to do that starting from scratch, it's going to take a very long time, which is why right now we have to just leave that up to other advanced countries. But what can we do? I think we have to try to support refueling stations for liquefied hydrogen. We believe that this is going to be the key trend going forward. So for liquefied hydrogen refueling stations, we want to try to see what are those technologies that we do not have, maybe a storage tanks. Those are something that we can uh, develop uh, technologies on. And this is also something that we can work on right now. However, the key items would be the uh, high pressurized pumps. These high pressure pumps, I think we are importing most of them from overseas. We want to develop them for use in the Korean market. And if we can do that, then we can cut down on the cost of liquefied hydrogen. If we can compress uh, liquefied hydrogen at 900 uh, bars, and then we can gasify them and then allow for direct fill. So that's pumps. And if we use liquefied hydrogen, this means that the refueling station would be lowered in terms of size by about 1 20th of its size. And the recharging capacity will be threefold the existing capacity. As I mentioned, there's a very low transportation cost. Compared to transporting gasified hydrogen, we can cut down costs by about three or four fold because the uh, we can transport more volume. And the most important aspect is the uh, low production facility cost because right now, if we were to build a liquefied uh, hydrogen a production facility, we would have to bring in other countries, uh, which would maybe require four four billion to about ten billion won. But if we can lower the cost, that's what will make Korean hydrogen more uh, competitive. If we look at the twenty five kilowatt hydrogen, we are thinking of. Uh, Building that at about 2 billion as opposed to the 3 or 3.5 billion that has already been mentioned before. If we can do that, then we can usher in an era of hydrogen economy. So, our, our organization's uh, plan is to try to come up with a model for hydrogen, for liquefied hydrogen below a cost of 2 billion. Next, I would like to talk about some case examples. Uh, last of part of my presentation uh, working together for localization with SMEC in Korea. There are a lot of uh, localized technologies that have been developed for refueling stations, but for there are many other uh, technologies that are being developed right now in the pipeline. Other than refueling facilities, the production facilities are made in unit form and they are sold, but there is nobody willing to purchase uh, this uh, unit-based uh, modules because there is, these have not been demonstrated, so it's difficult to tell what their capacity or performance is. There is a Kapyong module production unit that has been made by the uh, Korean uh, governmental think tank. 
the technology development began in 2017 and the development has been completed. It cost about 18 billion of uh, government funding to develop this. And development has been completed now. Uh, one Ear TNI, uh, an SME, has received this uh, technology. But one Ear TNI cannot sell uh, this uh, technology because it is still very far behind the international uh, records. I'm not saying that it's not functional enough, but there's no references. It has no track records, so nobody's willing to use it, which is why Kogas. We have a hydrogen complex that we're building in Pyeongtaek with the approval of Pyeongtaek and Gyeonggi-do. We want to try to promote the use of uh, local products. Pyeongtaek has agreed to engage in this demonstration project. Oh. We want to uh, support um, many of these uh, domestic companies, especially SMEs, to try to demonstrate their technologies. Even if we have the best in-class technologies, we cannot use them because they don't have a proven track record, which is why we want to try to use them in the Gyeonggi-do or Pyeongtaek sites. We want to demonstrate them and put them to use and prove the technology so that they could be sold in the future. Pyeongtaek right now is uh, working on, uh, together with these uh, compet competition projects with the MOTI. In 2021, in September of next year, we are going to complete building this uh, project. Other than, we are going to have uh, two different uh, reformers that are a capacity of uh, 300, 300 bars. These are some of the accomplishments that we've seen in the past on technological cooperative networking supports. Right now in Korea, the uh, reformed hydrogen uh, reformer, they're about small extractors uh, made by company H, J, and the one made by one year TNI, as I mentioned before. Their performance specifications are pretty much the same, but localization ratio is different. H, has an eight percent response, or its localization is about eighty percent. PSA is also something that is imported. Localization is at eighty-six percent. If we can be successful with demonstration, then its uh, localization will be ninety-seven percent, which is near to very close to one hundred percent. Korea is leading the hydrogen hydro industry right now, but most it is mostly overseas companies who are coming in to test and demonstrate their technologies here in Korea. So oh, this is a party that we are really hosting for other countries and other uh, international companies. We want to host a party for our local players here in Korea. You know, we want to promote a demonstration project for to uh, test the excellence of the hydrogen reformers we've localized. And so instead of uh, just a demonstration, maybe after two years of demonstration, we've proven that they are safe and they can perform well from year three, and we can uh, subsidize the cost of the reformers, in which case that will be helpful for that company and also for our uh, corporation. With that, this uh, fittings of the pumps, the reformers, if these technologies can be uh, homegrown, then perhaps they could be rolled out on a massive level here in Korea, which is really trying to lead the hydrogen industry. So this means that overseas as well, they might see that uh, Korean domestic uh, technologies are proven and they can be uh, rolled out. So that is our mission going forward. We want to try to export uh, various relevant technologies for the hydrogen industry. We hope that these uh, technologies can be recognized and acknowledged when they are exported. Thank you.
네, 송민호 처장님 발 Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Song, for your presentation, uh, we will get started with a panel discussion on the theme of ways to build the technology-oriented hydrogen industry ecosystem in Gangi province's role. Let me introduce the participants for the session number three panel discussion. We have uh, Lee sang uh Vice President of Korea Institute of SNT Evaluation and Planning, who will chair the panel discussion. We have uh, Director Ku yong -mo from Korea Automotive Technology Institute. We have Hong Dong-hee, uh, the Executive Vice President of uh, Hyrium um, Industries. We have Director Han Woo-jin from Ministry of Science and ICT. And also we have a Director uh, Kim kyung sub from Gyeonggi Provincial Government. Thank you very much. We, are jo we will be joined by online audience for uh, the panel discussion. Now let me invite uh, Lee sung yeop Vice President of Korea Institute of SNT Evaluation and Planning who will chair the panel discussion. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Lee sang yeop from Key Step, and I'll be chairing the panel discussion of the session number three. Uh, the session number three is focused on uh, the technology aspect of hydrogen um, industry. We have two presentations prepared for this panel discussion and also we will invite the two panelists for uh, the following uh, panel discussion. First of all, I would like to invite uh, the director, Young Mo Koo uh, uh, from Automotive Technology Institute. He will deliver his presentation on the theme of the hydrogen industry ecosystem development and the Gyeonggi province's role. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ku Young Mo from Korea Automotive Technology Institute. I'd like to introduce uh, the, the technologies uh, in terms of the uh, hydrogen industry ecosystem development. First of all, I'd like to brief you on the ecosystem of hydrogen industry, and also I'd like to touch upon uh, the entire life cycle of hydrogen, as well as uh, the expected roles of a Gyeonggi provincial government. Let us take a look at, at the hydrogen industry ecosystem. We are talking about the entire, uh, the value chain of, of the hydrogen industry. It's very difficult to identify one specific area as a key area because um, it, it has a wide uh, the range of uh, the businesses within the ecosystem and there are a great number of uh, the linked businesses, including the chemical, uh, the industry, and the steel industry. So this is a very extensive and large industry we are talking about. Uh, this hydrogen industry ecosystem has a lot of pathway options uh, ranging from uh, the securing of uh, the hydrogen resources to uh, the use of the produced uh, hydrogen. There are four kinds of uh, hydrogen production methods, gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen, and green hydrogen. Those three are widely uh, known uh, methods of production of hydrogen. However, there is another one, which is a turquoise hydrogen. It uh, doesn't generate any uh, CO2 over the course of hydrogen uh, production. This is a future uh, technology. And also, this belongs to the green um, hydrogen uh, category. We need to actually weigh the pros and cons of different uh, hydrogen production methods. So if we take a look at the gray hydrogen production technology, actually the technology is a, a, a very mature technology. And um, when it comes to the blue hydrogen production method, actually we do not have a tangible CCU technology in the area of blue hydrogen. Um, and also when it comes to the green hydrogen, actually we actually work on um, the development of key material or technology with regard to the green hydrogen production. Uh, we actually 
we also touch upon uh, uh, we will uh, touch upon the hydrogen storage methods um, whether we will store the produced hydrogen in the form of gas uh, liquid uh, or the liquid organic a form or the chemical hydrogen form so we cannot stick to one specific uh, form of, of storage rather we need to utilize the diverse combination of uh, the of the forms so we need to uh, think about the storage space or storage facilities first and then choose the relevant uh, the form of hydrogen so and uh, the same goes for the delivery uh, mode and actually we need to identify the most optimal delivery mode according to uh, the uh, the form of hydrogen to be delivered and also uh, the delivery method of the hydrogen is closely linked to the storage method as for uh, the long-term storage, the liquid organic or the liquid uh, uh, hydrogen storage uh, has been uh, have been talked uh, most. Now let me talk about the hydrogen delivery modes. Uh, the trucks can be utilized, or the lorries, or um, the tubes uh, can be uh, utilized. When it comes to the tank lorry, uh, the delivery mode. Uh, the liquid uh, hydrogen or the gas hydrogen can be delivered through this mode. And also uh, the, the ships or the vessels uh, can be utilized for uh, the maritime delivery of hydrogen. The most widely used uh, delivery mode is a trailer tube. But the thing is that all uh, transportation or the delivery modes of hydrogen are very expensive. So we need to establish pipelines for the hydrogen to reduce the delivery cost. But uh, there is uh, one serious issue about the establishment of hydrogen pipeline. The initial investment is too large when it comes to the setup of uh, the pipeline. And also we need to consider the, the delivery distance, whether it is a long distance delivery or a short distance delivery. And when we take a look at the Gyeonggi province uh, case, we need to think about uh, the destination point and uh, the departure point. So once the delivery distance is determined, then we need to think about what would be the most cost effective, effective delivery method. And if there is a need for uh, the development of a relevant delivery mode, we need to work on that um, as well. Now, let me talk about the hydrogen-related mobility aspect. So we are talking about all kinds of mobility which use hydrogen as uh, fuels. So there is land mobility, marine mobility, and aviation mobility. And there is a fuel uh, system for uh, the vehicle, uh, the, the automotives, and also the fuel cell stacks are utilized uh, for the purpose of land mobility and so on. Uh, so the automotives and the rail uh, road mobility can be utilized. Uh, in terms of uh, the FCEV related technology. However, if the mobility a a mode changes from land to marine or land to aviation, uh, the different uh, mobility technologies need to be developed. For example, once the aviation mobility is utilized, actually unmanned and manned, the area vehicles require different uh, mobility a mode. So we need to identify key technologies that required for each different mobility mode. Now let me talk about the hydrogen power plant. The fuel cells are most widely used for a hydrogen power plant. There are a multiple number of fuel cells, PAMFC, PAFC, AFC, MCFC, and SOFC. And actually, we need to identify the relevant fuel cell type based on the purpose or the use of the fuel cell, and also the different and uh, actually uh, the applications can differ based on uh, the applications or the based on the use of this uh, the hydrogen fuel uh, whether the cng is required h2 is used or well there is uh, some heat being generated or not and also, we need to consider where uh, the byproduct uh, heat is required for uh, some other related uh, the industries or not. 
And when it comes to this hydrogen power plant technology, we need to further develop the fuel cell related stake durability technology. So if you uh, make a comparison between uh, the heat ball that you use in your household, actually this fuel cell, hydrogen based fuel cell has a lower efficiency or kind of lower cost effectiveness uh, uh, compared to this heat boiler. And also, when it comes to the gas turbine based hydrogen uh, power plant, uh, there um, is a combination of LNG and hydrogen used. There also uh, is another uh, development project going on. Uh, on the development of this combined technology of LNG and hydrogen. Uh, now let me move on to the topic of uh, hydrogen supply and demand management, particularly in terms of safety. Uh, if you take a look at the left uh, uh, side, you can see the energy density per volume unit. And if you take a look at the right uh, hand side, you will see the energy density uh, per weight unit. So as you can see, hydrogen has low energy density per uh, the volume unit, but it has very high energy density uh, per uh, the weight unit. So uh, actually, hydrogen can be e e is stored in a very small space. Uh, uh, however, um, it will accompany higher risk of her stories. And if we use uh, some other uh, the method, which is adding some other uh, additives to further enhance the safety of hydrogen storage, then it will accompany another side effect. Why don't you take a look at the relevant video clip uh, with regard to uh, the risk of ignition uh, uh, in um, hydrogen storage facility. So if you want to ignite the hydrogen, it will be very difficult uh, uh, to ignite hydrogen. However, if there is a certain um, state of electricity involved or occurred in the storage area, then um, the ignition can occur very easily. So uh, why don't you think about uh, uh, the situation where you just take off a sweater in the winter time, you can uh, see that there is a lot of static electricity uh, occurred. So it's easily uh, occurred. So if there is very small amount of static electricity, then uh, it can be uh, very easily ignited. So if you take a look at the uh, refueling um, station, there are always uh, uh, a safety measure installed on, on the station field. As we all know, the ignition can occur very easily with a small amount of static electricity. So uh, there is a static electricity preve prevention pad installed in a hydrogen refueling station. So once uh, the re there is a self-service uh, hydrogen refueling station, then the drivers should uh, use or touch uh, the static electricity prevention pad before uh, refilling hydrogen into their vehicles. That's a must. And now uh, let me talk about the, the topic of hydrogen industry life cycle assessment. When we talk about the hydrogen industry life cycle, uh, people uh, think it's too difficult to understand the entire cycle. Uh, but uh, the, the hydrogen is a future uh, fuel. So the actually, hydrogen itself uh, doesn't um, generate any CO2 or greenhouse gas uh, when it is used as a fuel. However, when it comes to the production of hydrogen, there are certain processes which uh, generate uh, greenhouse gas or the CO2. So. Um, if you uh, take a look at the gr greenhouse gas emission or the CO2 emission uh, over the course of hydrogen production, uh, you can see that there is a, a certain or substantial amount of uh, CO2 being generated. And in order to have a relevant evaluation of greenhouse gas emission or CO2 emission over the course of hydrogen uh, production or the hydrogen uh, business, we need to conduct an entire life cycle assessment of hydrogen industry. Um, as it was mentioned repeatedly by the previous presenters, Korea uh, uh, lags behind in terms of this uh, technology. 
when it comes to the U, the case of uh, the U.S., there is a grid model. So the CO2 emission uh, generated by uh, the electric vehicle or the CO2 emission uh, generated by uh, the conventional cars are easily e evaluated and assessed in this grid model. And now let me talk about the pathway for the implementation of the gene and hydrogen industry, particularly in the region of Gyeonggi province. We all know that Gyeonggi province is a very large province, so it's very critical to identify the right pathway to each relevant region or sub-regional area. If you take a look at the population density, you can see uh, that uh, Gyeonggi province has uh, uh, a lot of people uh, living in um, the outskirts of the Seoul metropolitan um, city area. So why don't you take a look at uh, the detailed map uh, for further understanding of uh, population density of Gyeonggi province. As you can see, there are some R&D complexes in Gyeonggi province, particularly in, in the city of Yongin and Hwasong. And there are a number of hydrogen car part manufacturers in Yongin and Hwasong areas, but this, uh, the manufacturers have a lot of difficulties in quality assurance of hydrogen car parts. So uh, the key aspect here is to support these small and medium sized hydrogen car part uh, manufacturers in terms of the relevant technology development. And we all know that if you take a look at the detailed map of this hydrogen car, there are tens of uh, millions of parts uh, and components required for uh, completion of one hydrogen uh, uh, car or FCEV. And we also need to make sure that the quality is perfect for uh, all those uh, tens of millions of uh, components and parts for uh, the FCEV. And when it comes to the supply of hydrogen for the FCEV, we are thinking about uh, the bringing and the uh, hydrogen um, the energy or um, the energy source from uh, Pyeongtaek uh, for uh, the hydrogen industry activation in Gyeonggi province. Last but not least, I'd like to talk about the future mobility map for uh, Gyeonggi province. Uh, we need to think about what should be the ultimate goal for the mobility in Gyeonggi province. Thank you very much. Yes, that was uh, presentation by Mr. Gu Youngmo. So thank you very much uh, for that. We have to create a hydrogen ecosystem that's based on technology, and I think that that is what Gyeonggi-do has to really focus on and has already been mentioned beginning from production to use and safety. We have to look at many different R&D areas that we have to develop. It's very wide-ranging. I think that many users will have to work together to make that possible. You know, there is many different applications, both land, sea, and air. So as has been mentioned, I think that many SMEs based in Gyeonggi-do working on automobiles will have a lot to do in terms of uh, establishing hydrogen car infrastructure. So maybe a certification system to assure quality is something that the local governments should do as well. So thank you very much for the presentation once again. I'd like to introduce our second presenter, who is going to present on hydrogen initiatives for Gyeonggi-do. So Hong Dong-hee. Hello, I've just been introduced. My name is Hong Dong-hee of Hylium Industries. We work on hydrogen, we specialize company on hydrogen. We try to look at the various technological challenges that we have in front of us, and we're working together with Gyeonggi-do as a partner. So today I want to talk about the hydrogen strategies or initiatives. So what you see right now is uh, 
I think it was taken last year on a day when microfine dust was at its worst level. So there's almost like very little visibility on the streets. And this is because of the uh, carbon that is emitted from different energy that we use. As uh, civilization continues to advance, we use more coal, gas, oil, and even hydrogen. And carbon, the uh, coal has a lot of uh, carbon. And as you can see, it still continues to see some level of uh, carbon. Even gas uses uh, some level of carbon. So the more we use these energy sources, the more we use carbon. And carbon will continue to pollute the earth. And that's the situation that we're seeing right now. Which is why if we transition to pure hydrogen, then we can decrease this uh, burden on the environment. So this is CO2 emissions which is responsible for microfine dust. If you take a look at this, the uh, CO2 emissions is uh, quite high for South Korea. It is number seven in the world, which is commensurate to our economy. And I know that Gyeonggi-do has a hydrogen plan, and I would like to offer some food for thought. As the director has just mentioned, if we can provide hydrogen in a very high dense uh, population, will the residents, will the community be accepting of this? And secondly, in the metropolitan area, if we're going to provide energy, it's an energy supply network here, how are we going to change this? Although this is known as an eco-friendly future energy, how is this industry going to lead to job creation? And there is that LNG base in Pyeongtaek Harbor, but through this LNG terminal, can we establish an eco-friendly uh, transport system there? Is that the desirable way forward? For hydrogen energy to be sold in the market, its production costs would be very important and has already been mentioned in the presentation, green hydrogen compared to gray and blue hydrogen, they still in, lead to carbon emissions. So that's because of the issue of economic viability. We all know that green hydrogen is most eco-friendly, but for it to be used as an energy source, it is very expensive, which is why the speed of its uh, deployment in the market is very slow. It is why there is still uh, more use of gray hydrogen and blue hydrogen because they're more economic, because these uh, energy sources are cheaper. According to the IEA, from 2040 on, we will see byproduct hydrogen, the unit cost. Green hydrogen will match that level. Many countries that are not advanced countries right now will be competitive, will compete with each other in trying to produce green energy, which will drive down costs. Because we are a specialized company working with hydrogen, we have uh, been focusing on three things in particular. With hydrogen, the most important thing is to uh, guarantee safety. And secondly, how to store it in an efficient way. And thirdly, how to transport it in a cost-efficient way. These are some of the areas that we really focused on. And the conclusion that we reached was that we have to see that the hydrogen is liquefied at minus 253 degrees. With this liquefied hydrogen, we can make them much safer because liquefied hydrogen can be transported in a much safer way compared to gasified hydrogen. And we can have a storage efficiency about 800 times more than gasified hydrogen. And if we also factor in the transportation distance, the liquefied hydrogen transport and storage will also 
allow for a completion of the hydrogen ecosystem. For liquefied and gasified hydrogen, if we compare these different refueling stations, on the left you would see tube trailer based uh, gasified hydrogen refueling station, and on the right you would see liquefied hydrogen tank based refueling station. So that's uh, uh, Japan's case. You can provide more services with liquefied hydrogen. Storage is much easier and economically more feasible, so ultimately we have to more use more liquefied uh, hydrogen. Now that is the vision that we have going forward. Gyeonggi-do's uh, hydrogen economy strategy can be broken down into two stages, phase one and phase two. I think that this would be the best desirable direction forward. First, through the LNG terminal, we can make byproduct hydrogen or reformed hydrogen because in the process of LNG gasification, we can make that reformed hydrogen. And that cold energy can be used to make this hydrogen, which will really drive down cost. There's tube trailers or pipelines that could also be used to supply hydrogen, but through LNG cold energy, we can produce liquefied hydrogen and then supply that through the supply network in the metropolitan region, and I think that will be more cost efficient and effective. So this sort of a liquefied hydrogen network, if we can build this, then I think the community would be more responsive to this and it could be more efficient. Based on our research, compared to high pressured solid fuel, the liquid fuel is 20% more cost effective and 40% more storage effective. So that's something that we are able to achieve in a short term. The LNG terminal located at Pyeongtaek Harbor can allow for the uh, production of byproduct hydrogen and through the cold energy of uh, LNG, then at the same location, at the same site, so we can produce the hydrogen at lower cost. This LNG terminal will be the basis for a liquefied hydrogen uh, liquefaction production facilities. With all of these infrastructure in place, then we can create a supply chain for liquid hydrogen. With this liquefied hydrogen, we would have to build a plant infrastructure and the port trucks, forklifts, and other sorts of equipment based on uh, working on uh, hydrogen fuel cells, which do not emit uh, CO2. They can be used. And we can also build uh, liquefied hydrogen refueling stations. And by doing so, we can have this uh, new sort of uh, supply chain network near Pyeongtaek Harbor. With this uh, fixed liquefied hydrogen uh, facility, we can make sure that there's also a, a movable facility in place as well that can service the uh, transport base of buses and trucks in the nearby area, and that could also complete this extensive network. Based on this LNG terminal and the Pyeongtaek Harbor, we can create this liquefied hydrogen plant, and when we do that, the trucks and forklifts powered on hydrogen can be used widely to try to create a clean Pyeongtaek Harbor, and based on this plant, the Pyeongtaek Harbor would also allow for a decrease of a microfine dust and allow for this uh, environmental cleanup of the capital and met metropolitan regions. With the LNG terminal and the cold energy terminal, we can cut down on costs 
involved in production and allowing for this cost-effective liquefied hydrogen, we can also try to supply this uh, cheaper and safer hydrogen to the uh, metropolitan regions. And this will allow for uh, more jobs being created and new uh, projects based on liquefied hydrogen. And with the hydrogen-powered trucks, buses, forklifts, and different other equipment, with all of these uh, technological demonstrations, and maybe we can enter into the uh, global markets. This would also allow us uh, some business competitiveness. Pyeongtaek Harbor can look to California, LA, as a role model. They have about several fuel cell electric trucks and zero emissions uh, heavy duty equipment. Another global trend is with the mobility, and as has been already mentioned in the presentation, with hydrogen cars, uh, trucks, buses, trains, ships, and taxis or unmanned taxis or other different kinds of transport. We are engaged in different projects here. I think that hydrogen cars compared to EVs would be lighter and in mobility, this hydrogen powered cars can be a better uh, energy solution. We can uh, provide that level of a benefit. Lastly, in running our company, we have developed many different hydrogen-related technologies. We are a company that's been spin off from KISS. For hydrogen, liquefied hydrogen, we have uh, 20 years of experience in that regard. After spin-off, we've had 60 years of experience on technological development as a, a spun-off corporate entity to try to guarantee the safety of hydrogen. We've looked at silicon paint tape to detect hydrogen and also to look at uh, transport pipes without energy loss and to try to have us more efficient uh, storage tanks for liquefied hydrogen and low cost, high efficient uh, liquefied gasification of facilities. These are some of the different technologies that we have, which we have already patented. In 2015, we received the Russell B. Scott Memorial Award, a CEC. Based on these technologies, drones and unmanned aerospace uh, fuel cell packs and hydrogen-based drones are some of the uh, products that we're offering to the market. We also are supporting a mobile hydrogen refueling station. Before this liquid for hydrogen plant is deployed, before all these onshore refueling stations come online, hopefully through these uh, low-cost facilities, and we can provide more benefits to our customers. These are the different uh, uh, projects that we are providing to the market. Uh, California, with the 40 million population, has about 4, 000, uh, 7,700 hydrogen EVs and 64 refueling stations, but they are still trying to build a plant in three different sites at three, 30 tons per day capacity. Gyeonggi Ukdo will be very much committed to this, and our company will also, highly <coughs> Industries, will also be committed to Gyeonggi's efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we just completed with the second presentation for the panel discussion. Uh, Mr. Yum, as a business uh, owner, uh, explained what kind of uh, difficulties he has faced with, uh, particularly in terms of uh, hydrogen uh, the energy system transition um, in the area of Pyeongtaek Harbor. This concludes uh, the presentations uh, for the panel discussion session. Now I'd like to invite the two panelists to have a panel discussion on the two presentations. 
just made. First of all, I'd like to invite uh, Director Han Woo-jin of the Climate Change R&D team of Ministry of Science and ICT. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Han Woo-jin, Director of Climate Change R&D team of Ministry of Science and ICT. Uh, last October, the Hydrogen Technology R&D Roadmap uh, was announced by the Ministry of Science and ICT. And based on the roadmap, each different department um, is supposed to uh, engage itself in different uh, detailed project. And actually, my ministry is monitoring the progress of such a detailed uh, project. The previous two presentations are very impressive. And uh, Mr. Song min actually he explained uh, what kind of um, the projects are being made and what are the difficulties uh, ahead of uh, the implementation of hydrogen industry. I believe that all those two presentations will be very helpful uh, for my ministry to further proceed with uh, the roadmap of uh, the hydrogen and technology development. We all know that the hydrogen technology is a very very hard to develop and and however we actually need to think about whether the hydrogen is a truly clean um, the energy source and whether it can be a real solution to uh, the issue of climate change and climate uh, crisis in the future uh, Mr. Uh, Hong Dong He, uh, the Vice President Hong Dong He, actually he mentioned uh, the the micro fine dust, uh, the impact on our um, the daily lives uh, with a vivid picture. It was very impressive to me. As I mentioned before, actually hydrogen technology it was chosen as a solution to the climate change caused by greenhouse gas emission, and I believe that the micro fine dust issue is related to this climate change, and I believe that the the hydrogen technology, particularly the liquid hydrogen technology development, should be pursued and linked with other related industries. Liquid hydrogen um, is a one uh, key part in terms of future hydrogen uh, technology development uh, area. And the liquid hydrogen. Uh, is included as a one uh, a key a target area for the roadmap implementation. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my appreciation to Mr. Hong uh, Dong Hee and Mr. Uh, Koo Yong Mo for uh, uh, insightful uh, presentations. Now, let me touch upon uh, the progress of uh, hydrogen technology uh, R&D projects. Um, it seems uh, that the, the all uh, the members of the audience uh, are quite familiar with uh, the overall uh, the conceptual map of hydrogen technology thanks to the previous presentations. Now I'd like to focus on what kind of efforts are made by the relevant ministries of the central government with regard to the development of hydrogen uh, technology. As you all know, Ministry of Science and ICT is uh, responsible for uh, R&D projects of this new technology of hydrogen. And, and that's why we came up with the roadmap for the technological development. As you uh, can see in this diagram, we've actually made an uh, investment of uh, 410 billion Korean won uh, in this hydrogen technology area. As you can see, my ministry is responsible for the overall management of the, the R&D projects engaged by a different uh, ministries and also Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry is another key actor in terms of the management and the proceeding of the relevant hydrogen technology development um, the initiatives. Uh, this is a hydrogen a technology development roadmap announced by uh, my ministry. As you can see, by 2040, we have a mid and long term technology development strategy in the area of hydrogen uh, economy. And also, we are working on uh, increasing the implementation uh, or the enforcement and the power of uh, these initiatives. And this is a conceptual map of hydrogen production, and supply, and use. I believe that all the experts who are present here uh, know uh, this uh, concept already, and this is for the general public. Uh, 
Let me skip all of these uh, slides. I would like to talk about what kind of uh, the the business feasibility studies uh, are being conducted. As you know, when it comes to uh, the government the rules and regulations, uh, those projects which require uh, the budget higher than 50 billion requires government to review. So as you can see, the feasibility studies conducted to uh, obtain such kind of uh, approval from the central government. Um, please refer to my slides for more details. This concludes my discussion. Thank you for listening. Oh. Thank you very much. Earlier we've heard from, I was hoping that uh, you could discuss on the presentation that we've heard, but uh, you brought your own presentation. So perhaps you can comment on our uh, two presenters later on. But first, we'd like to move on to our second discussant from Gyeonggi province, Kim kyung who is the uh, Director for Climate Energy Policy Division. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm at the Gyeonggi Provincial Government. My name is Kim kyung I'm the Director for Climate Energy Policy. We're here uh, to discuss the role of Gyeonggi Province in uh, trying to create a hydrogen energy ecosystem. This is a very uh, difficult and challenging issue. And as the uh, director who is uh, responsible for this, I feel a heavy sense of responsibility. We've heard from Hong Dong-hee and uh, Koo Young-mo. And we've also uh, heard a bit of a presentation from Mr. Han Woo-jin talking about the different roles of Gyeonggi-do, uh, about the different roles of the government. We are uh, preparing for the future, and as an energy for the future, hydrogen is something that uh, we really have to focus on. It's a very big challenge for us, which is why Gyeonggi Province is hosting this Gyeonggi International Hydrogen Forum. I think that Gyeonggi-do has a lot of uh, tasks that it has to do because about 35% of the manufacturing industry base is located in Gyeonggi province. And we also have a lot of uh, parts and materials, uh, companies and equipment and manufacturers are located in Gyeonggi province. And so we have to say that the technologies related to the hydrogen industry have not been completely uh, localized, have not been completely made by uh, com domestic companies. But as has been mentioned by uh, Mr. Ku and Mr. Hong early on in the presentation, many uh, different countries have come up with hydrogen roadmap. So did we. So we have to do this uh, technological development. And from the point of view of the Ministry of Science, they understand the need for investment into many uh, research and development areas. But right now, most of the work that the uh, government is doing in for refueling stations and uh, hydrogen cars, it's focusing on infrastructure. But if we just focus on our infrastructure, all of these uh, parts and components that go into the infrastructure will have to be imported. They will all be brought by, from overseas. 42% of the refueling stations are localized. The rest are all imported from overseas. In fact, so the, the ratio of localization is quite low across the board. Most of the parts and materials and technologies are being sourced from overseas. So we are highly dependent on international imports, which means that if we have to uh, really want to roll out such infrastructure on a massive scale, then we would have to uh, see more localization. We have to uh, invest a lot of uh, investment. But when we do so only on infrastructure, that means we're basically paying other companies, uh, overseas foreign companies, to deploy this for for Korea, which is why I mentioned before that Gyeonggi province feels a heavy sense of responsibility. And the reason I said that is because 35% of uh, Korea's uh, manufacturing base is located in Gyeonggi-do. We also have a lot of a uh, skilled manpower. About 30% of them live in Gyeonggi-do province. 
these new industries and new technologies, we have a market here. Gyeonggi-do is home to about 30 million people, so we are a very good test bed. Well, this means a MOTI and Ministry of Science and different relevant ministries can help to resolve uh, this issue of uh, technological localization. Gyeonggi-do is really thinking about the same thing. With the hydrogen roadmap that was announced before and the relevant laws, with that, the country is trying to usher in a quick uh, transition to hydrogen economy. In the second half of last year as well, we have come up with a framework plan to uh, transition to a hydrogen economy. We have also secured the necessary budget and come up with the relevant ordinances and other different uh, standards for that. Gyeonggi-do has industrial infrastructure and it also has a very good uh, geographical base. So maybe MOTI and the Ministry of uh, Science, a lot of these different concerns that you have and the ideas for technological development, we are hoping to consult closely with the government With that, we can accelerate the transition to hydrogen economy. Gyeonggi-do will participate in that regard. Going forward, we will work very hard to allow for a technological localization for the hydrogen industry. Yeah, Thank you. Your discussion, uh, rather sounds like a commitment of Gyeonggi province. It's a kind of mission statement. What kind of uh, the work the Gyeonggi provincial government will uh, do uh, for the implementation of um, hydrogen industry? Now I'd like to have a Q&A session with the audience. We have presenters for the panel discussion session, and also we have two panelists who actually made a discussion on uh, the presentations made in this section. It seems that uh, both presentations and the discussions are um, the introduction uh, part of the hydrogen technology, particularly detailed implementation plans or the detailed actions are not fully discussed in this section. So I'd like to have a short discussion on uh, more details uh, of this hydrogen technology, particularly the first presentation of this panel discussion section um, briefed on the hydrogen and technology development area. So I'd like to know what would be the key technology development um, area for Gyeonggi provincial government. And as for the second presenter, Hong Dong-hee, he, he just mentioned the Pyeongtaek Harbor case only. So I'd like to know whether there are uh, some other uh, locations or the target areas that we can think of for the implementation of hydrogen and the power project, taking advantage of uh, the merits of those uh, specific uh, locations. So could you please be more specific about the detailed uh, roadmap or detailed actions? Yeah, I am Koo Hyung Mo from Korea Automotive Technology Institute. If I go into details of this hydrogen industry, I can go over and over, and it would take a, a longer than a day. So when it comes to uh, the specific or the optimal location for uh, this product, uh, the hydrogen industry, I think um, the everywhere can be a, the, the most optimal location for hydrogen production. What matters is cost effectiveness. Actually, the hydrogen production can happen everywhere. For example, in the city of uh, Ulsan, the hydrogen um, the production is more feasible because there uh, are uh, some uh, the linked or the related uh, industrial complexes located nearby. 
and the Kowloon province also just came up with uh, its commitment to, to pursue this liquid, uh, the hydrogen project. We are talking about the Gyeonggi province and its uh, unique uh, position. So we need to think about uh, why Gyeonggi province uh, should be selected as a kind of leading region in terms of hydrogen industry. We all know that uh, Gyeonggi province is near Seoul metropolitan area, and also there are intercity buses coming and uh, going between Gyeonggi province and the Seoul metropolitan city, and most of those intercity buses are diesel uh, buses. So we need to actually uh, uh, change uh, those uh, diesel or uh, intercity buses into uh, FCEV buses. The replacement of these intercity buses are kind of uh, obvious uh, uh, mandate or uh, the target ahead of us. But the thing is uh, uh, that uh, what will be the uh, the uh, best way to make such kind of shift or replacement. First of all, we need to think about the delivery mode or mobility mode. Uh, currently, we deliver uh, 200 kilograms of hydrogen uh, per uh, each trailer tube. However, we need to think about how we can actually have mass delivery of hydrogen to one ton or two tons. If we operate a multiple number or a large number of tube trailers, it means that there is increased risk of accident. So LOHC or the solid hydrogen or liquid hydrogen, which are easier to delivery or transport, uh, should be developed further here in Korea. This is not limited to Gyeonggi province, but also to all the uh, the cities and the regions here in Korea. And Gyeonggi province, as I've mentioned before, has a large commuting population. So this is a kind of imminent task ahead of, of uh, Gyeonggi province. Uh, yes, I think that uh, can you uh, respond to the questions that have already been raised? and. If we can talk about the different advantages that Gyeonggi province can have, or maybe the uh, different transport capabilities for Gyeonggi province. I did talk about the Pyeongtae Harbor as an example because in terms of a production, a liquefaction and transport of uh, hydrogen and even supply of hydrogen, uh, Pyeongtae Harbor has the best conditions to provide that one-stop service. And the context for that is that uh, it has very high level of uh, population density. It is located in the uh, metropolitan region of Korea. And another is uh, a, a big advantage of Gyeonggi province is that advanced countries already have this uh, history of about 50 years. They've continued to use hydrogen over the last 50 years. So except for a very few countries, the other countries have not had a lot of uh, progress or achievement when it comes to hydrogen. So we have to say that we were doing this in a very isolated way, but we have a lot of uh, R&D staff and many startups in Gyeonggi-do province. With those many partners, I think that we can continue to develop homegrown technologies. We have a very good base for that. And as I mentioned before, Pyeongtaek Harbor can allow a one-stop service from production to supply. So when we can complete that ecosystem, then for technological development, I think that we can really uh, step up the level of a speed. For a liquefied hydrogen, we are already using drones and many of our customers are already testing air tax. So companies like us are working together uh, to create more hydrogen refueling stations. Uh, using more localized parts and components, we can provide uh, service to overseas projects as well. We want to try to create that environment. I would also like to ask you for uh, your help in that the laws and regulations, they are not in place at the moment to enable all of these developments. If they can be put in place, then Gyeonggi-do's R&D and production infrastructure can all be done in a more effective manner. Together we can create a lot more value and we can also be more successful in terms of overseas business projects. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much for your answer. The central government, particularly the Ministry of 
Science and ICT is in charge of R&D project management in the area of hydrogen technology. Is there any advice that you can give to Gyeonggi province for its development of hydrogen technology? I lived in Gyeonggi province before I moved to Sejong city, a city of, uh, of government, and I still have my parents living in Gyeonggi province, so I have a great attachment to Gyeonggi province. When I heard uh, that uh, the Gyeonggi province uh, was going to hold this International Hydrogen uh, Forum, I uh, thought about why uh, the Gyeonggi province decided to hold such kind of um, hydrogen um, forum and why Gyeonggi province took interest in uh, hydrogen industry and hydrogen technology. After hearing all the previous presentations, now I learned why uh, Gyeonggi province uh, has a keen interest in the development of hydrogen uh, technology and industry. So in terms of hydrogen uh, technology development, actually the use of this development, the technolo developed technology is very important. And I believe uh, that the development of original technology as well as the breaking down of uh, hindering regulations and rules can be done uh, by the central government, particularly the Ministry of Science and ICT. And when it comes to the specific advice uh, which can uh, be given to Gyeonggi province in terms of hydrogen um, industry development, I think I need to give more thoughts to that and I am willing to create a consultative body between uh, my ministry and the, uh, the Gyeonggi province. Uh. Uh, thank you very much for that. Lastly, we would like to uh, hear uh, from the director who said that he is really motivated to uh, promote this work. Perhaps you can uh, let us know some of your commitments on uh, Gyeonggi-do's uh, province's plan for hydrogen economy. You said that you, Gyeonggi-do is responsible for a big percentage of uh, manufacturer, of personnel, of SMEs, that it has about over 30% of all of that. So perhaps you can talk about how Gyeonggi province can be a base to really facilitate the hydrogen economy going forward. In that regard, as a someone who is uh, has to lead this hydrogen economy, instead of just making commitments, maybe you can give us something more concrete. Yes, I uh, felt a very heavy sense of responsibility when I spoke just before, which is why I think uh, my face uh, revealed that kind of uh, feeling in me. But listening to the other presenters and the other panelists, I thought about what it is that Gyeonggi-do should do. So I would like to thank the panelists for pointing out exactly what we have to do in terms of the technological development that we have to do. Mr. Han talks about the different areas where uh, they could work together with the government on. I'm very glad that I came to this panel discussion. Perhaps uh, going forward, we can uh, work together to create a good results. I think that the uh, director also mentioned that uh, Gyeonggi province, Gyeonggi-do, for transport and use, compared to other local governments, we have a very good uh, base, very good uh, conditions. And I think that that really gives us a competitive edge. Uh, the director has mentioned that we are still trying to uh, figure out exactly what we should do because we do have strengths being in the metropolitan region, but this could also be a handicap for us because over half of the uh, Korean population are living in the capital and metropolitan regions. But many people, we know that hydrogen is very safe and uh, clean, but most people still have that idea of uh, hydrogen as the most expensive kind of gas. So there's so many people who think of hydrogen in that manner, which is why, as has been mentioned in the earlier panel discussions, they talked about 
uh, how uh, the uh, public should be able to recognize hydrogen as a very clean and safe uh, energy source. To have all of these hydrogen cars going around in the metropolitan region might be very uh, concerning to many people living here. So in that regard, we have to really communicate well with the community about this uh, sort of PR issue. And that is also something that the governments should work together to try to tell more people that hydrogen is very safe, uh, that it's a convenient form of energy for them to use. The tube trailer, when the uh, hydrogen goes around with in you know in the form of tube trailers, it looks very dangerous. But we have to try to create a more safe uh, su supply and transport uh, network. Maybe having different facilities and using pipelines instead to supply uh, the hydrogen. And we are looking at various different options. And secondly, on a uh, technology. Uh, hydrogen energy is still in its initial stages. There aren't many areas, maybe about 400 different units related to hydrogen uh, nationwide, and over 100 of them are in Gyeonggi-do province, and about 50% of them uh, are responsible for parts and materials. So as Mr. Han said, We also have to try to provide some level of a technological support. That's also something that Gyeonggi-do province can do. So in terms of uh, transports and use, uh, we will also do our best because we have a level of technological capability already in Gyeonggi-do province. There are many big companies as well as uh, SMEs in Gyeonggi-do province who can provide a level of support. Uh, that level of uh, technology. And we can look at the uh, demand side early on and work together with the central government. We will have uh, those discussions. We just uh, hope for massive uh, state funding and we will do the rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, it goes to the topic of uh, the budget. In the end, like uh, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, we had many scientific imaginations, such as cars running on water. And it, I believe that uh, some of the imagination that we had has been realized as a, a reality in these days. So um, I remember the days that I learned about the hydrogen as a, a atomic component in my science uh, class when I uh, was a, a middle school student. We all know that Gyeonggi province uh, takes 30% uh, of uh, everything um, here in Korea, population, industry, business, and so on. And actually, uh, the direction that the Gyeonggi province will take uh, uh, with regard to the implementation of hydrogen economy will have a huge impact on other uh, the cities and the regions. Uh, my office is located in Chungcheong province and there are a lot of questions being asked by uh, different cities and the regions here in Korea about uh, the feasibility of hydrogen industry and hydrogen economy. And Gyeonggi province is uh, taking a leadership in terms of our discussion and the policy development of uh, hydrogen economy and hydrogen industry. And also today's forum is a great opportunity for us to put our thoughts together and to think about the most optimal uh, direction uh, that we can choose for the implementation of hydrogen economy and hydrogen um, energy system transition. And it will be also a, a, a lot of publicity for Gyeonggi province uh, to uh, actually publicize uh, its uh, initiative in hydrogen economy. And I believe that the detailed action plans and detailed technological roadmap uh, need to be prepared to support uh, the master roadmap. I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, our presenters and the panelists once again. Thank you very much.
I would like to extend my appreciation to Lee Sang Yup, uh, who chaired the panel discussion for the session number three, and also I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my appreciation to all the panelists. Uh, this concludes the session number three, and we will get started with uh, the session number four shortly. Session three has ended. We will be back with session four. Thank you.